screwdriver. This will do. Thirteen months and seven days. That is when I lost her. Today I continue my endeavor, my search for something to inspire me. The chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me in my desperately wounded condition to pass a day in the open air. It was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the Apennines. Not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. Ascending the creaky stairs, gazing around this cold and despair-filled hallway, I find myself asking yet again, could I find it here? Can a voice that has been lost be inspired within these tattered walls? What is my apartment number? 213. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with unusually spirited modern paintings and frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, my incipient delirium grabs, it caused me to take deep interest. I felt as if she was speaking to me. Her golden locket spilled out of my jacket almost in a loss of words. I remember this day her photograph was taken. I do not recall if I was there. Where was I? I thus saw in vivid light a picture unnoticed before, a portrait of a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at it to make sure my vision had not deceived me. Beneath it was a plaque. She was a maiden of rarest beauty and not more lovely than full of glee, and evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his heart. She, a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. All light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. I wish to paint you. Surely you don't mean that. No. No, my love, I most certainly do. For so long I've wanted to paint you. And now the day's here. Yes, but no, it's all... You were the most beautiful thing in my life. And no. I want this day to last forever. But it's a... It's our wedding day. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. Here, put this on.
You are so beautiful. Come now, love. Let's sit you down. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark, high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour and from day to day, and he was a passionate and wild and moody man who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride. Then the brush was given, and the tint was placed, and for one moment the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought. But in the next, while he yet gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast, and crying with a loud voice, turned suddenly to regard his beloved. This indeed is life itself. She was dead. I remember where I was. I was not there. I have never really been there. It is as if I were a ghost strolling by the emotional void that my love has lost. My bargain was my work. And like the painter, all I have is this picture, locked away forever, outside my heart. <laughs> <laughs> 